you're just going to go through and refute these three heretical videos put out by Stephen Anderson a couple of years ago, where he just lies openly to cover up the pre-trib rapture and prove his post-trib rapture heresy. Okay, let's get right into this. Today I want to talk about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, which I've often been shown by those who believe in the pre-trib rapture. And this is a verse that they believe is very clear evidence that the rapture comes before the tribulation. Let me read it for you, and, and you can be the judge. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Well, there you have it, folks. Crystal clear, right? I mean, that verse just teaches a, a pre-trib rapture. I don't understand uh, how you don't see it, viewer. Well, actually, I'm just kidding. I don't see it either, because it's not there. The Bible says, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It's a pretty vague verse for these pre-tribbers to be resting their entire doctrine upon. Now, you say, Pastor Anderson, how do they even get a pre-trib rapture out of that verse? Well, it's easy. They get it from Schofield's notes. In the Schofield... Um, no, we don't get it from Schofield's notes. I'll show you how we get it, okay? Let me just, and this is what post trippers do. They don't compare scripture with scripture, which is why they're believing this post trip rapture heresy, because if they were to compare scripture with scripture, they wouldn't believe it, because it just destroys the whole post trip rapture doctrine. They, they always say, give me one verse, give me one verse, okay? You don't base doctrine off one verse. You compare verses with other verses. Okay, and I'm going to show you why we use 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 to prove a preacher of rapture. Okay, let me read it for you. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be, re wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Okay, who is it talking about? Who needs to be taken out of the way? Well, it's the body of Christ. How do we know? Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 to 11. Okay, this is, again, this is why I compare scripture with scripture, which post servers don't do, which is, makes sense because if they did, they would disprove their whole system. Uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. Okay? What do you got here? Well, you have blood-redeemed saints, and they're in heaven. And you know what's kind of interesting about that? They're in heaven before the Antichrist is revealed. Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. It's the Antichrist. So wait a second. You have he who now let will let he who now let if will let until he be taken out of the way. Paraphrasing, of course. And then you have Revelation chapter five, where you have blood redeemed saints in heaven before the Antichrist is revealed. In Revelation six two. See, that's why we use it as a preacher of rapture proof, because the body of Christ needs to be taken out of the way before the Antichrist can shows up. This also goes back to the thing of how God will not punish the righteous with the wicked. You know, He takes us out of the way, and then the Antichrist shows up. That's simple. So that's why we use it as a preacher of rapture verse, because we compare it with other verses. And you're going to see he lies about what we say and says that, oh, we're saying it's the Holy Spirit. No, it's the body of Christ, not the Holy Spirit. You know, getting ahead of myself, but let's continue. The reference Bible, he explains that he who now letteth is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has to be taken out of the way. Notice, notice his mocking spirit, too, by the way. Typical of post troopers, though. Or the Antichrist can be revealed, and since the Holy Spirit lives inside believers, that means believers have to be taken from this earth in order for the Holy Spirit to be removed, then the Antichrist can be revealed. And so the Holy Spirit is restraining the Antichrist, and so believers have to be removed. Now look, let me explain to you why... Again, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's the body of Christ. Another verse that ties into this is Acts chapter 9. You know, another good proof text against the uh, post trib rapture heresy. Again, this is more backs up the thing of how the body of Christ needs to be taken, someone banging outside. The body of Christ has to be taken out of the way. Here's another good thing that ties into that. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he be found any of this way, whether they be men or women, full screen, sorry, I forgot to do that, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, 
And he fell down to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, this is Jesus speaking, watch what he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And in verse 5, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So wait a second. Paul was never persecuting Jesus Christ, but he was persecuting his body, the Christians. And it was affecting Jesus Christ up in heaven. So wait a second. So we're going to go into this time period and face God's wrath. So basically Jesus Christ will be pouring out the wrath on himself, essentially. You know, Again, this ties into the thing. We're taken out of the way. Because if we weren't taken out of the way, it would mean that he'd be pouring out wrath on himself. Which is ridiculous. So something that ties into that. Another thing that ties into this is Genesis chapter 18. I know this is probably just so hard for the post tribbers because they just they, they don't want to endure sound doctrine. And too, too many verses. You didn't do a simple refutation. Just sit down and, and shut up and listen to the verses. Let the scriptures be your final authority. Um, where is it? Abraham or not? Sorry, uh, Genesis chapter uh, 18, verse 25. Oh, sorry, uh, it was verse. 23, that was, a, that was a verse, 23 to 25, sorry. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preventure there be 50, 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee, to do after this manner, slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Well, what's, what's happening here? Well, Abraham was saying because Lot was in the city of Sodom with, with these Sodomites, these these um, these uh, what, what I, you know I got I got to censor my speech because YouTube is going to shut me down if I say something too offensive. But you had these Sodomites in Sodom, and Lot is the only righteous person in this entire city. Okay, and you're saying how does this tie in? Okay, post strippers again, just try to endure sound doctrine. Okay, Lot is in Sodom and Gomorrah, and and God is going to destroy the city because of these Sodomites. And Abraham is basically saying, you know. Are you going to destroy the city if there's a righteous person still there? You know, God will not punish a righteous person with the wicked. God is not going to judge the earth if righteous people are still on it. He's not going to put righteous people through his wrath. You know, this ties into the thing of how we're taken out of the way. He's not going to pour out wrath on a righteous person. You know, again, this is why you're supposed to compare scripture to scripture. Again, it's probably so hard for the post trippers because they just, they really just, just can't endure a sound doctrine. But, again... Uh, Anderson lied to prove his heretical doctrine. You know, we're taken out of the way. God will not pour out wrath on his on his own body, and we're not. He's not going to pour out wrath on the righteous with the wicked. That's simple. Why this is completely unbiblical and blasphemous and false doctrine. First of all, the Holy Spirit is God. You cannot just take God out of the way. He's God. He's everywhere. The Bible says that if we ascend into heaven, he's there. If we make our bed in hell, he's there. If we go down to the depths of the sea, the Bible says the Spirit of God is there. The Spirit of God is everywhere. The Spirit of God is God. Now, now see how he's setting up the straw man argument, okay? True, true post or sorry, true people who believe, true Christians, I'll say, who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, no, it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, yes, the Holy Spirit does not dwell in Christians, like it dwells individual individual Christians, but it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the body of Christ. We're taken out of the way. Again, compare this back to Genesis 18 and Acts chapter 9. You know, God's not going to pour out wrath on his own body, and he's not going to pour out wrath on the righteous with the wicked. That's simple. You can't take him out of the way. He's God. And so to say, well, well, believers are going to be taken because the Holy Spirit's got to be taken. You know, that's a big, big stretch. And it's also blasphemous to say you're going to take God out of the way. And it's also just not in the, in the verse at all. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit. And that leads me to my next point. You know, the pronoun he there is taking the place of a noun. Pronouns take the place of a noun. And every pronoun has what's called an antecedent. No, no, watch what he does. Because he can't, he, because he doesn't compare a scripture to a scripture, he has to go in this big, huge, this huge explanation of like what little pronouns and little, all this other stuff. Because he won't compare a scripture to a scripture, so they have to have this big, huge thing to try to distract from the point. This is what post tribbers do. A word that comes before it to tell us what that pronoun is. You see, if you just start using the word he with someone and you haven't told them who you're talking about, you're going to confuse whoever you're talking to. First, you mention the person's name. I might say, I have a... I mean, what? Uh, typical post trippers they just have to have these big, huge, you know, just distractions, essentially. Uh, and then, next video, runs in Matthew chapter 24, of course. We're going to show you the problem with that, too. 
Uh, it's totally ridiculous. They, they always do. They, they always run the Matthew chapter 24, all this other stuff. It's just heretical nonsense. The Holy Spirit is not leading them to do this. Today I want to read for you one of the clearest passages that just explicitly spells out a post-tribulation rapture. No, no, no. It explicitly spells out the post-tribulational rapture. Okay, where's the word rapture and where's the word post-trib in that passage? It explicitly spells it out. No, you're a liar. It doesn't, it doesn't say post-tribulation rapture or the rapture. No. Ridiculous. A rapture that comes after the tribulation. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, we see in this passage certain elements that make it very clear that this is about the rapture because, of course, those who are believing in a pre-trib rapture don't want to admit that this is about the rapture. Um, it's, not, it's not talking about the rapture. I'll show you some proof on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, good place that talks about the rapture. Um, where is it? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery that we shall not all sleep, but we shall be all be changed. Not the best at reading on a computer, so just bear with me. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The dead are raised. Okay? And it goes down there. So the dead are raised. This is also repeated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses... Um, is it, oh, sorry, verse 13. But I would have you not to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus, well, also, or sorry, Jesus, will God bring with them. Uh, for this we say unto you by the word of by the word of the Lord. Again, not the best at reading on a computer, so just bear with me. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, and the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with and with the trump of God, and when the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the dead in Christ are rising first. You have a problem though, because uh, there's no mention of dead saints rising first in, first in Matthew chapter 24. Because you have it in both 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But you go to Matthew chapter 24, there's not one mention of dead saints rising first. Show it to me. If you're a post trader show me one verse in Matthew chapter 24. Because if this is about the rapture, show me one verse that talks about dead saints rising first. Okay? When it talks about immediately after the tribulation of those days, when they gather together their elect, it's talking about the elect are Jews. Talking about the Jews is just talking about the second coming. That's simple. It's not talking about the rapture because there's no mention of dead saints rising first. So, Anderson lied. Let's do a smaller screen. Now, of course, the last video is there is no pre-trib rapture before 1830. They always have to do a straw man argument, okay? And I'm going to show you that there was a mention of the uh, pre-trib rapture before 1830, but even if it was only invented in 1830, uh, the standard is what does the Bible say? What does the scripture say? It's not what, what have Christians always believed or who said what first or, you know, that kind of stuff. It's what does the scripture say? That's your standard, okay? Even if it was only invented in 1830, if the Bible teaches it, you go by it, Okay? The Bible, are you going to follow the Bible or man's traditions? That simple. Okay, and this is this is Catholic type of reasoning right here, saying that, oh, well, because Christians have not always believed it, therefore that makes it not biblical. You know, this is Catholic reasoning, because Catholics, I've gone back and forth with Catholics, they'll say that, well, because the early Christians believed it, therefore that makes it official doctrine. Uh, no, what does the scripture say? Okay, if the Bible says it, that makes it doctrine. Okay, the standard is not what have Christians always believed or, or who came up with what first. The standard is what does the scripture say? That simple. Because the pre tribulation rapture is not found in scripture whatsoever, we have to ask ourselves the question where did this doctrine come from? Well, first of all, it was never taught 
before the year 1830 that there's any record of whatsoever. And believe me, there are a lot of books, commentaries, uh, theological treatises, tracts, sermons, pamphlets that were written before 1830 that still exist today. 1830 wasn't really that long ago and there's all kinds of documentation of what people believe, what they preach. There are all kinds of theological works and yet not one scrap of paper before the year 1830 that teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, Waltry says, there is not one scrap of paper before 1830 that taught a pre-tribulation rapture. He lied. I'll show you some proof that he lied. Just Google Wikipedia and just Google pre-tribulational, or just Google the rapture, okay? Because he says there's no writing before 1830. It's kind of funny because there weren't a whole lot of writings about faith alone before, you know, Martin Luther. So that means you can't believe in faith alone. You know, very, very, very bad and weak reasoning. Very, very, uh, it's Catholic reasoning. That's what it comes down to. You're putting the the man's tradition, what have Christians always believed, to the place of Scripture and even above the Scriptures. And he did, he did this with his Marching to Zion film. He tries to say, well, Christians have historically have historically rejected the Jews and viewed them as, as satanic and that kind of stuff because he can't deal with the Scriptures. So he has to say, well, what's the historic position of Christians? As if that somehow determines doctrine. But anyway. Uh, go on Wikipedia and just Google Rapture and go in the section of pre-tribulational premillennialism. It says pre-tribulationalism traces its roots to the post-apostolic era as far back as the Shepherd of Hermes, 140 AD. So wait a second, there was the pre-tribulation rapture, there's writings about it in 140 AD. That was way before 1830. Which alludes to the idea that believers in Christ will not suffer the tribulation, suggesting a possible pre-tribulational view. Other attendances of the pre-tribulationalism can be found in the Apocalypse of Elijah, Apocalypse of Pseudo-Ephraim, and the History of Brother Dilakano, I think that's how you say it, which present very clear and early forms of pre-tribulationalism, though less redefined. Modern pre-tribulationalism gave rise in the 17th century. So there it was about the 17th century too. Okay? So Anderson, he says there's no mention of it before 1830. He lied, because here's what actually happened. Um, it was popularized extensively in the 1830s by John Nelson Darby. Okay, so it was mentioned before 1830, but it was it became more popular in 1830. Anderson lied. He lied to cover up his uh, heretical doctrine. All three videos, he just, he just blatantly lied, which is typical of post tribulation They have to lie to prove their satanic heresy. So, you know, don't be deceived by this heretical post trib nonsense. It, it's from it's very very satanic. It, it just, it's satanic. It just makes God into a liar. It makes God as if he's going to pour wrath on his own body and put righteous people through his judgment, which is completely out of his character. So uh, don't be deceived by this post-trib satanic nonsense. God bless you. Goodbye. Thank you.